The history relates that it was with the greatest attention Don Quixote listened to the ragged knight of the Sierra, who began by saying, Of a surety, senor, whoever you are, for I know you not, I thank you for the proofs of kindness and courtesy. You have shown me, and would I were in a condition to requite with something more than good will that which you have displayed towards me. In the cordial reception you have given me but my fate does not afford me any other means of returning kindnesses done me save the hearty desire to repay them. Mine, replied Don Quixote, is to be of service to you, so much so that I had resolved not to quit these mountains. Until I had found you, and learned of you whether there is any kind of relief to be found for that sorrow under which from the strangeness of your life you seem to labor. And to search for you with all possible diligence, if search had been necessary. And if your misfortune should prove to be one of those that refuse admission to any sort of consolation, it was my purpose to join you in lamenting and mourning over it, so far. As I could for it is still some comfort in misfortune to find one who can feel for it. And if my good intentions deserve to be acknowledged with any kind of courtesy, I entreat you, Senor, by that which I perceive you possess in so high a degree, and likewise conjure you by whatever you love or have loved best in life, to tell me who you are. And the cause that has brought you to live or die in these solitudes like a brute beast, dwelling among them in a manner so foreign to your condition as your garb and appearance show. And I swear, added Don Quixote, by the order of knighthood which I have received, and by my vocation of knight-errant, if you gratify me in this, to serve you with all the zeal. The knight of the thicket, hearing him of the rueful countenance talk in this strain, did nothing but stare at him, and stare at him again, and again survey him from head to foot. If you have anything to give me to eat, for God's sake give it me, and after I have eaten, I will do all you ask in acknowledgement of the goodwill you have displayed towards me. Sancho from his sack, and the goatherd from his pouch, furnished the ragged one with the means of appeasing his hunger, and what they gave him he ate like a half-witted being, so hastily that he took no time between mouthfuls, gorging rather than swallowing. And while he ate neither he nor they who observed him uttered a word. As soon as he had done he made signs to them to follow him, which they did, and he led them to a green plot, which lay a little farther off round the corner of a rock. On reaching it he stretched himself upon the grass, and the others did the same, all keeping silence, until the ragged one, settling himself in his place, said, If it is your wish, sirs, that I should disclose in a few words the surpassing extent of my misfortunes. You must promise not to break the thread of my sad story with any question or other interruption, for the instant you do so the tale I tell will come to an end. These words of the ragged one reminded Don Quixote of the tale his squire had told him, when he failed to keep count of the goats that had crossed the river. And the story remained unfinished but to return to the ragged one, he went on to say, I give you this warning because I wish to pass briefly over the story of my misfortunes, for recalling them to memory only serves to add fresh ones. And the less you question me the sooner shall I make an end of the recital. Though I shall not omit to relate anything of importance in order fully to satisfy your curiosity. Don Quixote gave the promise for himself and the others, and with this assurance he began as follows.
My name is Cardenio. My birthplace one of the best cities of this Andalusia. My family noble, my parents rich. My misfortune so great that my parents must have wept and my family grieved over it without being able by their wealth to lighten it for the gifts of fortune can do little to relieve reverses sent by heaven. In that same country there was a heaven in which love had placed all the glory I could desire such was the beauty of Lushinda. A damsel as noble and as rich as I but of happier fortunes, and of less firmness than was due to so worthy a passion as mine. This Lushinda I loved, worshipped, and adored from my earliest and tenderest years, and she loved me in all the innocence and sincerity of childhood. Our parents were aware of our feelings, and were not sorry to perceive them, for they saw clearly that as they ripened, they must lead at last to a marriage between us, a thing that seemed almost prearranged by the equality of our families and wealth. We grew up, and with our growth grew the love between us, so that the father of Lushinda felt bound for propriety's sake to refuse me admission to his house, in this. Perhaps imitating the parents of that Thisbe so celebrated by the poets, and this refusal but added love to love and flame to flame. For though they enforced silence upon our tongues they could not impose it upon our pens. Which can make known the heart's secrets to a loved one more freely than tongues for many a time the presence of the object of love shakes the firmest will and strikes dumb the boldest tongue. Ah heavens! How many letters did I write her? And how many dainty modest replies did I receive? How many ditties and love songs did I compose? In which my heart declared and made known its feelings, described its ardent longings, reveled in its recollections and dallied with its desires. At length growing impatient and feeling my heart languishing with longing to see her. I resolved to put into execution and carry out what seemed to me the best mode of winning my desired and merited reward, to ask her of her father for my lawful wife, which I did. To this his answer was that he thanked me for the disposition I showed to do honour to him and to regard myself as honoured by the bestowal of his treasure but that as my father was alive it was his by right to make this demand, for if it were not in accordance with his full will and pleasure. Lushinda was not to be taken or given by stealth. I thanked him for his kindness, reflecting that there was reason in what he said, and that my father would assent to it as soon as I should tell him, and with that view. When I entered the room where he was I found him with an open letter in his hand. Which, before I could utter a word, he gave me, saying, By this letter thou wilt see, Cardenio, the disposition the Duke Ricardo has to serve thee. This Duke Ricardo, as you, sirs, probably know already is a grandee of Spain who has his seat in the best part of this Andalusia. I took and read the letter, which was couched in terms so flattering that even I myself felt it would be wrong in my father not to comply with the request the duke made in it, which was that he would send me immediately to him, as he wished me to become the companion, not servant, of his eldest son and would take upon himself the charge of placing me in a position corresponding to the esteem in which he held me. On reading the letter my voice failed me, and still more when I heard my father say, Two days. Hence thou wilt depart, Cardenio, in accordance with the Duke's wish, and give thanks to God. 
who is opening a road to thee by which thou mayest attain what I know thou dost deserve and to these words he added others of fatherly counsel. The time for my departure arrived I spoke one night to Lushinda. I told her all that had occurred, as I did also to her father, entreating him to allow some delay and to defer the disposal of her hand until I should see what the Duke Ricardo sought of me. He gave me the promise, and she confirmed it with vows and s woundings unnumbered. Finally, I presented myself to the Duke, and was received and treated by him so kindly that very soon envy began to do its work. The old servants growing envious of me, and regarding the duke's inclination to show me favor as an injury to themselves. But the one to whom my arrival gave the greatest pleasure was the duke's second son, Fernando by name, a gallant youth, of noble, generous, and amorous disposition, who very soon made so intimate a friend of me that it was remarked by everybody for though the elder was attached to me, and showed me kindness. He did not carry his affectionate treatment to the same length as Don Fernando. It so happened, then, that as between friends no secret remains unshared. And as the favor I enjoyed with Don Fernando had grown into friendship, he made all his thoughts known to me, and in particular a love affair which troubled his mind a little. He was deeply in love with a peasant girl, a vassal of his father's, the daughter of wealthy parents, and herself so beautiful, modest, discreet, and virtuous, that no one who knew her was able to decide in which of these respects she was most highly gifted or most excelled. The attractions of the fair peasant raised the passion of Don Fernando to such a point that, in order to gain his object and overcome her virtuous resolutions. He determined to pledge his word to her to become her husband, for to attempt it in any other way was to attempt an impossibility. Bound to him as I was by friendship, I strove by the best arguments and the most forcible examples I could think of to restrain and dissuade him from such a course but perceiving I produced no effect I resolved to make the Duke Ricardo, his father, acquainted with the matter. But Don Fernando, being sharp-witted and shrewd, foresaw and apprehended this, perceiving that by my duty as a good servant, I was bound not to keep concealed a thing so much opposed to the honor of my lord the Duke. And so, to mislead and deceive me, he told me he could find no better way of effacing from his mind the beauty that so enslaved him than by absenting himself for some months, and that he wished the absence to be effected by our going, both of us, to my father's house under the pretense, which he would make to the duke, of going to see and buy some fine horses that there were in my city which produces the best in the world. When I heard him say so, even if his resolution had not been so good a one I should have hailed it as one of the happiest that could be imagined, prompted by my affection. Seeing what a favorable chance and opportunity it offered me of returning to see my Lushinda. With this thought and wish I commended his idea and encouraged his design advising him to put it into execution as quickly as possible, as, in truth, absence produced its effect in spite of the most deeply rooted feelings. But, as afterwards appeared, when he said this to me he had already enjoyed the peasant girl under the title of husband, and was waiting for an opportunity of making it known with safety to himself. Being in dread of what his father the Duke would do when he came to know of his folly. It happened, then, 
that as with young men love is for the most part nothing more than appetite. Which, as its final object is enjoyment, comes to an end on obtaining it, and that which seem to be love takes to flight, as it cannot pass the limit fixed by nature. Which fixes no limit to true love what I mean is that after Don Fernando had enjoyed this peasant girl, his passion subsided and his eagerness cooled, and if at first he feigned a wish to absent himself in order to cure his love, he was now in reality anxious to go to avoid keeping his promise. The Duke gave him permission, and ordered me to accompany him we arrived at my city, and my father gave him the reception due to his rank I saw Lushinda without delay. And, though it had not been dead or deadened, my love gathered fresh life. To my sorrow I told the story of it to Don Fernando. For I thought that in virtue of the great friendship he bore me I was bound to conceal nothing from him. I extolled her beauty, her gaiety, her wit, so warmly, that my praises excited in him a desire to see a damsel adorned by such attractions. To my misfortune I yielded to it showing her to him one night by the light of a taper at a window where we used to talk to one another. As she appeared to him in her dressing gown, she drove all the beauties he had seen until then out of his recollection. Speech failed him. His head turned. He was spellbound, and in the end. Love smitten. As you will see in the course of the story of my misfortune and to inflame still further his passion, which he hid from me and revealed to heaven alone. It so happened that one day he found a note of hers entreating me to demand her of her father in marriage. So delicate, so modest, and so tender that on reading it he told me that in Lushinda alone were combined all the charms of beauty and understanding that were distributed among all the other women in the world. It is true, and I own it now, that though I knew what good cause Don Fernando had to praise Lushinda, it gave me uneasiness to hear these praises from his mouth, and I began to fear, and with reason to feel distrust of him, for there was no moment when he was not ready to talk of Lushinda. And he would start the subject himself even though he dragged it in unseasonably. A circumstance that aroused in me a certain amount of jealousy not that I feared any change in the constancy or faith of Lushinda. But still my fate led me to forebode what she assured me against. Don Fernando contrived always to read the letters I sent to Lushinda and her answers to me, under the pretense that he enjoyed the wit and sense of both. It so happened, then, that Lushinda having begged of me a book of chivalry to read, one that she was very fond of, Amadis of Gaul. Don Quixote no sooner heard a book of chivalry mentioned, than he said, Had your worship told me at the beginning of your story that the Lady Lushinda was fond of books of chivalry, no other laudation would have been requisite to impress upon me the superiority of her understanding, for it could not have been of the excellence you describe had a taste for such delightful reading been wanting. So, as far as I am concerned, you need waste no more words in describing her beauty, worth, and intelligence for, on merely hearing what her taste was. I declare her to be the most beautiful and the most intelligent woman in the world and I wish your worship had, along with Amadis of Gaul, sent her the worthy Don Rugal of Greece. For I know the Lady Lushinda would greatly relish Derida and Garaya, and the shrewd sayings of the shepherd Derinel, and the admirable verses of his bucolics. 
sung and delivered by him with such sprightliness, wit, and ease. But a time may come when this omission can be remedied. And to rectify it nothing more is needed than for your worship to be so good as to come with me to my village. For there I can give you more than three hundred books which are the delight of my soul and the entertainment of my life though it occurs to me that I have not got one of them now. Thanks to the spite of wicked and envious enchanters but pardon me for having broken the promise we made not to interrupt your discourse. For when I hear chivalry or knights errant mentioned, I can no more help talking about them than the rays of the sun can help giving heat, or those of the moon. Moisture pardon me, therefore, and proceed, for that is more to the purpose now. While Don Quixote was saying this, Cardenio allowed his head to fall upon his breast, and seemed plunged in deep thought and though twice Don Quixote bade him go on with his story. He neither looked up nor uttered a word in reply but after some time he raised his head and said, I cannot get rid of the idea, nor will anyone in the world remove it, or make me think. Otherwise and he would be a blockhead who would hold or believe anything else than that that errant knave Master Elizabeth made free with Queen Madasima. That is not true, by all that's good, said Don Quixote in high wrath. Turning upon him angrily, as his way was and it is a very great slander, or rather villainy. Queen Madasima was a very illustrious lady, and it is not to be supposed that so exalted a princess would have made free with a quack and whoever maintains the contrary. Lies like a great scoundrel, and I will give him to know it, on foot or on horseback, armed or unarmed, by night or by day, or as he likes best. Cardenio was looking at him steadily and his mad fit having now come upon him. He had no disposition to go on with his story, nor would Don Quixote have listened to it. So much had what he had heard about Madasima disgusted him. Strange to say, he stood up for her as if she were in earnest his veritable born lady to such a pass had his unholy books brought him. Cardenio. Then, being, as I said, now mad, when he heard himself given the lie, and called a scoundrel and other insulting names. Not relishing the jest, snatched up a stone that he found near him, and with it delivered such a blow on Don Quixote's breast that he laid him on his back. Sancho Panza, seeing his master treated in this fashion, attacked the madman with his closed fist but the ragged one received him in such a way that with a blow of his fist he stretched him at his feet and then mounting upon him crushed his ribs to his own satisfaction the goatherd who came to the rescue shared the same fate and having beaten and pummeled them all he left them and quietly withdrew to his hiding place on the mountain Sancho rose, and with the rage he felt at finding himself so belabored without deserving it, ran to take vengeance on the goat herd. Accusing him of not giving them warning that this man was at times taken with a mad fit, for if they had known it they would have been on their guard to protect themselves. The goat herd replied that he had said so, and that if he had not heard him, that was no fault of his. Sancho retorted, and the goat herd rejoined, and the altercation ended in their seizing each other by the beard, and exchanging such fisticuffs that, if Don Quixote had not made peace between them, they would have knocked one another to pieces. Leave me alone, Sir Knight of the Rueful Countenance, said Sancho, grappling with the goat herd for of this fellow who is a clown like myself 
and no dubbed knight. I can safely take satisfaction for the affront he has offered me, fighting with him hand to hand like an honest man. That is true, said Don Quixote, but I know that he is not to blame for what has happened. With this he pacified them, and again asked the goatherd if it would be possible to find Cardenio, as he felt the greatest anxiety to know the end of his story. The goatherd told him, as he had told him before, that there was no knowing of a certainty where his lair was but that if he wandered about much in that neighborhood, he could not fail to fall in with him either in or out of his senses. <laughs>